like there's other aspects of wealth that are not necessarily tied to money and you can get that with the profit first system but the, the work's got to be put in it's, there's no magic bullet um and i i hate it when i see financial professionals tout a magic bullet that's going to solve gym owners problems you know, it's six week challenge. We're going to do the six week challenge, but we're going to end up baiting and hooking all these people. And then you're going to have pissed off members and your current <laughs> members that are really good. You know, it's like, there's no magic bullet guys. You got to yeah. do the work. It's the same yeah. with the financially fit side. Yeah. Like Tom uh, Plummer always says, hard work is not sexy, but um, you need to do the hard work to get to the sexy parts. Hey, what's up everybody. Welcome to masters in fitness business podcast, where you get to stand on the shoulders of giants. And today I have a giant coming to you from the great state of Utah. We have John Briggs who runs insight tax and he also wrote profit first for micro gyms. So he runs the profit first systems for studio uh, and smaller gyms, independent studios. So the guy knows, fitness, the fitness industry, and he knows finance, he knows accounting numbers, all of that stuff. So he's been kind enough to come on to the show and explain the specifics of the care stimulus package of what type of loans are um, covered in that or contained in that, and how what they are the specifics and how you can get your money because there is a finite amount of money and chances are they're going to run out sooner than later. So John, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Did I get all of that uh, information correct? Yeah, sounds good. Okay. All right. Well then let's get, let's get right into it uh, because you have a unique pedigree in that you, um, you do accounting, you specialize in the fitness industry and you own a gym. So you definitely know the nuances of this industry. Um, and you said you read all 800 plus pages of the care package of the care. Yeah. Stimulus. Stimulating reading, very stimulating. <laughs> yeah. I can only imagine. <laughs> so uh, break it down. I know you said there are two types of loans that you can get with this stimulus package. You want to share that with the listeners? Totally. Um, and the good news is, Every day that passes that this stuff is going on, we get more clarity um, from what's going on. So let's start with what they first are calling economic injury disaster loans. Those are the loans that have existed for a couple weeks now. Those are the loans that you apply directly through the SBA's website. So if you aren't sure what that link is, if you type in SBA, like Google, if you go Google, SBA disaster loans, you're going to find the link to apply. The application as of today is super simple. It takes most gym owners who, um, even those who I hear say uh, they claim they are not good with numbers, even someone who thinks they're in that category, it's going to take them less than 30 minutes to fill out. The economic injury disaster loans are true loans, and that'll make more sense when I talk about the other loans. Um, up to 4% interest rate, terms of 10 to 30 years. And um, you can, there's a $2 million max on what you can ask for. Those loans can be used for business expenses. It can be used for payroll. It could be used for rent, like vendor payments, whatever the business needs to stay open. Um, this is also the loan that people hear about that has the $10,000 free money tied to it. Um, I want to clarify that though, because it may not be free money. The way it works is if you fill out the SBA application, at the end, there's a box that says, yes, I'd like $10,000 advanced to me. Uh, it might even say a grant, having the grant advanced to you. Well, what that, from everything that I've read, what that means is if they send you the $10,000 and they deny your application, you get to keep the $10,000, you don't have to pay it back. If they approve your loan, then it's considered an advance. So if I ended up getting approved for 50,000, they already sent me the 10, at the point of the final approval, they're only gonna send me 40 more to total the 50 that they approved me of. Um, so that's the economic injury disaster loans. The other loans, which are the well, ones... Well, hold yeah. on. Before, before we get, that, uh, get to the other loans, uh, the triple P loans, okay, so 
it's a ten thousand dollar advance. So what's to prevent me from submitting information that almost guarantees that I'm not going to be approved so I can get ten thousand dollars? You know what I mean? Where is the totally. bar? Where is the bar for that approval rate where it becomes a grant versus a loan that I have to pay back? No one knows. Um, the application, the only financial information that it asks for is effectively what was your gross revenue last year and what was your cost of goods sold. And for a, a gym, the cost of goods sold they're referring to are things if you sell supplements or apparels, those types of things. And it doesn't include merchant processing fees or paying your team member or coaches. So no one knows how they're denying or how they're approving loans. Um, no one even knows if everybody's going to get the $10,000. I mean, at this point, I heard rumors that there's a $1.6 million application backlog. So, 1.6 million people have already applied? Yeah. Holy crap. Okay. All right. Uh, I mean, I don't know where that person came, brought the number from. I don't know if it's 1.6, but for sure, I'm 100% sure there's a backlog. Yeah, but I, uh, with all things financial... I recommend putting the truth on the application and then let the SBA determine if they approve it or not. Yeah, that's good advice. So with 1.6 applications already submitted is, are these funds coming out of the same kitty as the other one? No, totally different kitty. Okay. So there's a chance that this money will be around a lot longer than the stimulus money. Yeah. In fact, that's um, the, the reason we know that is because you can apply for these loans through December and the paycheck, the triple P loans we're going to talk about here in a second, those you can only apply for through June. But, uh, well, I mean, I'll just say it now, I don't think you need, I, I think if you wait till June, you're not getting anything. Cause that is a limited kitty. They they've set aside 350 billion for it, which sounds like a lot, but, um, to put it in context, I was talking to one of my clients and his amount that he can apply for on the triple P loan, is half a million dollars. So you, it like for gyms, it's not going to be that big of amount of money. I think most gyms are probably going to be in the twenty to fifty thousand dollar range. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's every other business, small business in the world, less than five hundred employees who could apply for this. Um, so the three fifty billion, I think, is going to go pretty fast. Okay. All right. So we've covered the economic injury disaster loans the EIDL loans, as you call them. And these are loans that, um, unless you get rejected, are not forgivable. You have to pay them back up to 4% interest. You apply directly through the SBA for these, and they uh, don't come out of the stimulus money. That's right. So there's not a... Um, in theory, there's not a finite amount of funds available for these loans. There might be a finite amount of funds, but it's a lot larger. And these are true loans. So um, the, the issue with the other ones is that they can be forgiven. And even like we'll get into what, how banks have pushed back on that. Um, but these other ones, though, they're true loans. So it's any banking institution. Well, in this case, it's the U.S. Treasury and the SBA they're interested in, in lending these out because they know you have to pay it back. But okay. that being said of loans, it's a phenomenal loan, 4% interest rate, potentially 10 to 30 years. Like that's a phenomenal business loan. Yeah, I agree. Okay. So then let's get into the triple P loans and let's okay. start off. Well, why do they call them triple P loans? Yeah. Um, Cause someone was like, Hey Bob, let's call it triple P to see if uh, we can get people to think about going to the bathroom. <laughs> but they changed it at the last second and i swear there's an inside joke there in congress that we don't know about so they're called paycheck protection program loans hence the triple p um and if you think about the name it helps us so that we understand the intent of the government in offering them paycheck protection so these loans are really in my opinion just another form of unemployment so that they can, you know, keep the unemployment system not completely overburdened. The estimates at this point, people are thinking there might be 30 million people on unemployment when all this is said and done. Uh, so this is to help people off of unemployment, protect their paychecks for at least a couple more months. Um, the way these loans work, you will apply directly through your bank. 
So um, your bank is the one that basically sets the rules. So if we think about the 880 pages of law that exists, the way I have to think about it is they came in and said, here's the board for the game and here are some board game pieces. The banks came in and said, we'll write the rules. Um, and I'll get into one of that because there's a big question, especially for gym owners, that's going to come up that they're not going to be happy with my answer, but don't shoot the messenger. It's the government's fault. Um, okay, so paycheck protection program loans, the most you can apply for is two and a half times your average monthly payroll costs. And right now, uh, if you were in business last year, they're going to look at your 2019 payroll cost for the whole year divided by 12 that's likely going to be the number that you would use for the most that you can apply for these loans are very exciting because if you use them for payroll mortgage interest or rent or utilities the loan will be forgiven that means you don't have to pay it back and uh i mean that that's why these are the most coveted things right now in the entire world and as soon as banks start processing these later today, uh, I imagine, or Monday at the earliest, uh, anyways. And today is April back. 3rd for the listeners. We're recording yeah. this on April 3rd. Today is April 3rd. Um, they're going to go fast. I, I would not wait around on this one. This is, a, this is like your ox is in a mire. There's a fire. Put it out. Like Whatever the heck you're doing, if you haven't applied yet by the time you're hearing this, um, see if you can apply and and do it as soon as possible because it's a much like we talked about the much smaller pool i think so the next question people i usually get is then well how how is it forgiven how do i know it's forgiven what do i need to do they are saying um you can use so i listed those expenses payroll mortgage interest rent utilities if you use the loan for those purposes only 25% of the loan can be used on the non-payroll expenses. So if I got a $10,000 loan and um, I used 2,500 of it to cover rent, mortgage, and utilities, I'm good, and I use the other 75% on payroll, then the, the loan is gonna be forgiven. If I use all 10,000 of it on rent, only 20 it's only likely that $2,500 of it is going to be forgiven um, I'm gonna have to pay back the rest now as of yes yesterday the terms were better and we don't have final guidance yet but I do know the banks pushed back on the 0.5 percent interest rate you know because it wasn't enough for America to bail them out in 2008 they're not willing to do loans at half a percent because they might not make any money on it even though also with all these changes it happened in the last two weeks they've been able to clean up their balance sheets um, with this crazy interest rate stuff going on they literally I freaking hate banks at this point like what a problem in our society the amount of power that they have so they literally in the way I look at it is last night or at least the last couple of days they effectively told the government we're on strike we're not going to offer these loans um, at 0.5 percent interest rate so you need to give us better terms that are favorable, more favorable for us. Rumor is they might jump it up to 1%. Even if it's 1%, it's still a phenomenal loan, potentially to your payback period, because uh, that's what it was stated before. So if you end up having to use all of the triple P loan proceeds on rent, it's still not a bad play. The issue is, is that you're limited to two and a half times your payroll cost where the EIDL loans, um, you're probably gonna be limited based on your revenue and uh, the SBA's thought of your ability to pay that back. But if we think about the loan, most people who get this loan are gonna be able to use it for payroll expenses and get it forgiven. The way the mechanics of it work is, let's say I get the $10,000. From the day I get the $10,000, I have an eight week window and in that eight weeks is when I need to use those loan proceeds on the payroll expenses or the other ones that I mentioned in order for it to be forgiven. Anything that I spend after that, um, I'm not in trouble for, I'm just not gonna get it forgiven. 
I mean, I would think based on, think about it like when you play a board game, you have the rules, you know what the end objective is. I think if we just think about this as a game and say the game here is to make sure when I get a loan for this purpose that I'm going to win by getting it forgiven. So don't delay, like have your plan in order so that you know how to use those funds in that eight week window so you don't have to pay it back. Yeah, and I think it's important to, um, to mention that it's not retroactive. So anything you paid up until you the funds get transferred into your account, you can't apply to this loan, correct? Right, exactly. It's for the expenses after you get it that they're going to be looking at. Okay, and then from the day it arrives in your bank account, you have eight weeks to spend it on those allocated funds or whatever, and then then it transfer after they decide what portion or funds will be forgiven, then they just originate a loan based on the balance, correct? Yep, exactly. Okay. All right. And then you make all of those terms with your local banker. Yeah, they're they're setting the rules here. Um, okay. I was going to say too, so I know some gyms have already laid off their coaches. You are not in trouble. You could still qualify for this loan, so don't worry. What will happen is as soon as you get the loan, you're going to hire back your coaches and you're going to pay them during that eight week window uh, so that, uh, you know, you, you'd qualify for loan forgiveness. So don't, don't fret like, Oh crap, I made a bad decision. It's not the case. You, you can still hire them back, still get the loan forgiven if that's the scenario. Okay. All right. And then, um, so that covers the two types of loans. You got the EIDL loans and the triple P loans. Um, and both have their pluses and minuses depending on where you are and what you want to do and your situation and all of those things. What about the, the independent contractor, the, yeah. the trainer out there that has their own business is an LLC sole proprietorship and they're a, a business of one person. How do, how do these loans apply to them? Good. So I feel like for the first time we have some, Better, much better clarity on that question today. Supposedly, as of last night, the banks and the SBA and the Treasury agreed on some terms. I haven't read what those new things are, but I have had a banker send me what the new application looks like. And um, it is very clear now, even though the law says a gym owner could include payments to independent contractors as part of the amount that's forgiven, the banks are saying that is not a rule we're putting into the game. So the payroll costs that they're referring to is true W-2 payroll cost. If you want the loan to be forgiven, it's going to be paid to employees, not owner distributions, not independent contractors. What that means, though, independent contractors, sole proprietors, self-employed people, which honestly most of the time refer to the same thing. Those are all just synonymous terms. Um, your coach, if they're a contractor, is one of those or all of them. They are going to want to apply for their own triple P loan. And for them, it is, it's going to be based on their net income. Okay. And, and then how does that apply to them as far as getting the loan forgiven? So same deal. Because they're self-employed, as long as they... Well, I mean, I guess they're going to have to provide documentation. I'm not entirely sure what the bank is going to look at. My guess is they're going to look at profit and loss statements, potentially even ask for bank statements to verify. But the way I look at it is, like, for a sole proprietor, their net income is their pay. Like, that's the money left over after expenses. And so that's the amount they're going to use to figure out how much they can even apply for. And then... Uh, in their case, it's distributions that's going to count is it, my current interpretation of how it goes. Okay. So two important point, uh, points I got from that. One, you can't pay independent contract. If you pay independent contract, if you're a gym um, that with employees or independent contractors, if you pay independent contractors out of your triple P loan, that will not be forgiven. Correct. It will not be forgiven. You can do that, uh -huh. but it won't be forgiven which is why I think it's better if the coach, if the owners encourage their coaches who are contractors to get their own loans. And then, then they have to uh, work with their banker, the bank that they're applying with 
to cover the terms, the amounts, what's forgiven, what's not, all of that good stuff. Yeah. And what documentation they need. Yeah. Is now that we correct? don't. Yeah, that's correct. And we don't need to talk about how I stupid I think that rule is the banks are putting in, because mm -hmm. literally what they've done is given themselves more work. If me as a gym have all independent contractors as coaches, which our gym does, I, I can't even apply for the triple P loan without knowing that it's not going to be forgiven. So instead of having one app, one person apply, which I'd be happy to do on behalf of my coaches, now they're going to have four coaches apply. So that's four separate loans and they're now going to have to process. It's so stupid to me. I am beyond livid that the law says this is how it is. And the banks came in and said, no, like little bratty children. Um, but it is the game that we have to play. Yeah, I got you. That's what happens when the government runs things. But um, versus uh, private industry. Um, but also another uh, important point is for businesses with employees of $500, 500 or less employees, businesses with 500 or less employees, they can apply starting today, April 3rd. In theory, the banks in, have to be in, ready for it. Like I, okay. right before we got on, I checked Chase's website and they still say they're not currently accepting loans. Again, I, last night I said, I think it'll be a miracle if we see any blank, any banks actually processing this today. If we do, I think it'll be later afternoon. Okay. But the independent contractors, the sole proprietorships, they have to wait till April 10th. That's correct. And then they will. As only, of right now, at least from yeah. what we've seen. <laughs> and, and that's only if there's money left after April 10th. Yep. Okay. Gotcha. All right. Anything. Well, I mean, that's, every, I mean, that's pretty comprehensive and yeah. pretty simple, pretty succinct. I appreciate you doing that, John. So anything that, I missed, we missed on covering any of this. Um, no, we didn't miss anything, but I, I've been having a lot of these conversations this week, <laughs> a lot. Um, and I just, as a CPA and a fiscally responsible person, I just want to throw in this last little caveat. It's, it's one of these things where it's like, when you heard about the run on toilet paper, which made no sense, <laughs> But you're like, I don't need toilet paper, but everybody else is buying toilet paper and I need toilet paper. I want to have toilet paper when I need toilet paper. Therefore, I should go and get toilet paper as well. This is kind of the same thing that's going on with this loan. I feel like it's like free money. Everyone else is getting free money. Let me apply for free money. Um, and I just want everyone to actually think about how, like, have a plan for your loan if you're going to get it. Um, I believe if you were a struggling gym before this scenario, and even possibly have already taken on other debt, I don't know if borrowing more money is going to fix your problem. Mm. I think what's a better solution is take the time now to get a better business plan, identify the holes that were in your system before, identify the expenses that you shouldn't have had before so that you don't perpetuate this and also problem. them the employees that maybe you don't want that are bogging you down absolutely mm -hmm. now's a great time let them get on unemployment mm -hmm. the, unemployment has never been so sexy for people i mean potentially up to sixty thousand dollars a year people can get for not working mm -hmm. like yeah like shed off all the fat i'm just from a loan perspective conversation if you couldn't afford your business operating expenses before borrowing money to get through this time period to then start back up in a scenario where you also can't continue to pay your business expenses. All you've done is dug a deeper hole for yourself. So really ask yourself, like, what is my plan with this money? Because it does have to be paid back and that is a cash outflow. So, but just let's all be responsible with it and not be too crazy about the free money thing. Yeah, absolutely. And then we're going to do a second podcast on based on the profit first system. And we're going to and we're going to talk about that the need to, to get a coach, a financial coach, and be fiscally responsible. And if your business is losing money, find find out why, and what you need to do to turn it around, because that's a good advice, just because it's free money doesn't mean it's the the uh, what's the word panacea that's going to fix all the problems in your business. If yeah. anything, it's just going to prolong the pain because you're getting a cash infusion, but then it 
you know, is working to pull more, more money out the door than it's already going out the door. So it's just a temporary fix. So fix your business. And then if you feel like you need to apply for one of these loans, then do that. It's basically what you're saying. Yeah. And I think that's great advice. Um, I mean, this is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to do lots of things. I mean, if you want to take up, you know, knitting, you can do that, you know, because you got time. But for me, I want to look at my business and I want to look at ways that I can improve my business through this time. So it's just an opportunity. So, John, uh, this has been awesome. Um, thank you very much for putting in simple, easy to understand terms. Um, Cause I know this situation is very fluid. It's changing every day. Uh, like this whole COVID-19 thing is changing every day. Um, so um, where can people get in touch with you or find you if they want to, if they have more questions, want to seek out um, you for coaching or anything like that? Yeah. So our website is www.insighttax.com. That's to incite a riot. So I N C I T E tax.com um, and just click the contact us form and we'd be happy to help anybody who's interested in assistance okay great all right john thanks a lot for doing this and i hope you guys got some great information i know i did uh, it helped reduce my anxiety level just having the information and knowing what's what uh, that basically there's two types of loans and then i just have to get together with my financial guy ivan and talk about which one is the best one uh, for my business going forward, if any of them are. So, uh, John, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks. <laughs> All right, and then we'll do the we'll do the second one, um, and I'll just roll in and I'll introduce you. Then we'll go right into the profit first and how just what we did yesterday, okay. but this time we'll record it. Uh, now I find myself checking the fact that it's recording all the time. All right, so, well, hey, what's up everybody? Welcome to Masters in Fitness Business Podcast where you get to stand on the shoulders of giants. And today I have returning a giant from Utah, John Briggs. He is the author of Profit First for Micro Gems. For those of you that might be familiar with the Profit First system, I know I'm a big fan of it. Um, and as trainers, you know, we don't know numbers and I don't want to know numbers. That's why I talk to guys like John and uh, my guy, Ivan, and because they know numbers, they love numbers. They love numbers like I love training. Uh, so I let them do it for me. Uh, and he also owns Insight Tax Services. They work with over 300 gyms already. So they know how to help gyms become financially viable and profitable. Um, and we covered one thing um, before, but I, I feel it's so important that we have to mention it again, is that there's nothing worse than fussing your ass seven days a week, 12 hours a day in your business and having nothing to show for it. And what I mean by that is that when it comes time for your taxes, your accountant says, okay, here are your taxes. You've made this much money this year and you had a really good year. You've made this much money and now you owe the government this much money. And we're talking 10, I, one year I owe $30,000, you know, and you think about that. It's like, that's a lot of fucking money, you know, especially if you're not planning for it. And if you're not squirreling in a way, it's not part of your financial architecture of your business so and i know there's a lot of owners in that in that box have you encountered that john oh my gosh yeah i'm laughing i'm just imagining the handful of stories uh that we get you know every week during tax season with that it, it's hey you know it looks like you had a good year and first of all they're like what do you, i they're already shocked i had a good year well yeah your financials had a good year and you owe this much in taxes and then it's like the f-bombs like what are you talking about how is that possible? I, where is that money? So they're asking me, it's like, sometimes it's like, did you take my money out of my bank account? Well, where's <laughs> my money then? Yeah. Um, and I can tell you, it, it's the, it's the kiss of death for a gym owner when, when they end up having a tax bill that they're not planning on or weren't aware that it's going to be so big, it can take them a long time to recoup from that. Yeah, absolutely. 
So let's get into that because I know uh, there's a lot of owners out there that are in that boat, uh, either have been in that boat, experienced that scenario, or they're in that boat now heading for that waterfall and they don't even know it. Um, so uh, let's talk about, first of all, what is the profit first system? And, and then we can talk about how you have tweaked it for the micro gym industry. Perfect. Um, and what you started with is, man, so true. Like despite working a heroic amount of hours, gym owners still find themselves living paycheck to paycheck. Mm -hmm. So profit first is a cash flow management system that really is designed to let the gym owner be home at dinner time with their family and let their gym thrive. Um, to talk about profit first, I always like to start talking about Parkinson's law. And it'll make sense in a minute why I start with that. So Parkinson's law, the easiest way for me to describe it instead of his sterile definition is to say this. If you have money in the bank account, you're going to find ways to spend that money. That is Parkinson's law. You spend money to the extent you have cash available to spend. So we look at our typical human behaviors as gym owners and say to ourselves, I have the one bank account, I have money in the bank account, and I'm making business decisions based on the balance in that bank account. Unfortunately, if we didn't take the time to think about it, we already have committed some of that money to other things. Whether that commitment is to pay our coaches, to replace equipment, to keep our doors open with paying the rent, the government, uh, they've committed for us to pay taxes. You should be committed to yourself to pay yourself a reasonable wage so that you, you know, have motivation to keep doing what you're doing. Those are all commitments. So every time a dollar comes into your bank account, you already have those commitments that exist. And if you're not thinking about it, you're going to spend the money on other things, not realizing it's already been spoken for. So with the profit first system, uh, we just say, instead of having one bank account, let's have other bank accounts and each other bank account is going to have a specific purpose like squirreling away money for taxes at the end of the year paying myself as an owner giving myself profit distributions covering equipment repairs or new equipment purchases when those need to come up so i automatically put money aside into those separate accounts now when i look at my operating expense account instead of seeing say thirty thousand dollars in there I'm going to see $10,000 in there because I don't want to make decisions um, thinking I have 30,000 available when in reality, by putting in the other accounts, I realize 20 of it's already committed. I'm going to make decisions based on having $10,000. And now it forces me to have a more leaner business. It helps me see where I'm bleeding cash. It, it helps me see a lot of things. So that's kind of the nuts and bolts of the system. Yeah, no, uh, I appreciate that explanation. And I'm sure our readers do as well. John, I need to step away for two seconds. There's a guy had a leak in my closet in my bass master and he's here fixing it. So I need to talk to him yeah. real quick. I'll be no right back. When do you think the painter will come by? Um, well, I can be here Monday if that's all right. Yep, that works. You can come any time, any day that's available for you after that. It's going to be Friday. same day, Monday Friday. or Friday. Yeah. Okay, then yeah. I'll come back Monday. I'll have him come over Friday. Perfect. All right, all right thanks, man. All right, sorry about that. Um, no so. I'll, I've also heard the profit first system described as the old envelope system. Like when your mom and it, you know, it was my mom, but you know, where she had envelopes, she would get her paycheck and then she would put, you know, this is groceries, this is rent, this is utilities. So that way that money was out of sight, out of mind. And then she knew where, how much money she had left over for discretionary spending. Yeah, and it's funny um, that Mike Michalowicz, the author of Profit First, he and I are pretty good friends at this point. And uh, he said that too many times. He's like, you guys, it's just the old envelope system for yeah. businesses. And it's yeah. like, yeah, it's a genius system. 
Right. So, and then you took it and you um, were specializing in working with micro gyms and you found through experience that you had to tweak this, uh, the system a little bit to make it more um, applicable for fitness businesses. You want to share with the listeners how you did that and how you came up with yeah. that? Yeah. Um, so as you mentioned, we, we currently work with 300 plus gyms. Um, and many of them we've helped them run through with the profit first system. And so we've seen our fair share of helping gym owners implement this and every single time without fail, we had to customize the original profit first system to fit what the fitness professional was doing. And, um, it just happened that about a year ago, um, maybe it's even a year and a half ago, Mike, the author of Profit First said, look, if you guys have a niche that you're working with and you feel like there's a difference, I'm going to give you an opportunity to write the book for that niche. And so I'm like, uh, I mean, immediately the second he finished the meeting, I got up and sprinted to the head of the class to be like, yeah, definitely have to write that book because um, I think Profit First is a every gym owner should be using it, but when they read the original book, many of them think like, oh, in theory, this sounds nice, but I don't see how it applies to me. So having done this with many, many, many gyms, I was the perfect fit, not to mention I'm a gym owner myself. So um, there was another component I could speak to. So we wrote Profit First for micro gyms. And here are some of the changes that we made. In the original book, when we talked about the separate bank accounts, uh, we refer to those as small plates. Sometimes it's a small plate theory, um, which um, as fitness professionals know, relates to the dieting idea. You know, if, if you can't get your people to change their eating habits, at least get them to use a smaller plate because they will consume less calories just because it's a smaller plate. Mm -hmm. So Mike had five small plate bank accounts and that was the income account, operating expense, uh, owner's pay, profit, and tax. Well, we know from working with gym owners that, um, first of all, there's equipment wear and tear, and that is going to have to be replaced. If not, your quality, like your quality experience with your members starts suffering. So we created an additional bucket for equipment. And then the other one came down to how are gyms paying their coaches? In the original system, which was confusing for gym owners, um, it was confusing for me, so uh, don't feel bad if you're a gym owner and confused by it. Mike would have you take your subcontractor payments out of your gross revenue to get to a, a number he called real revenue. Well, if you paid your coaches 1099, he's saying they should be subcontractors. If you paid your coaches W-2, then they'd come out of operating expense account. And so literally as I'm writing the chapter in the book, and I'm thinking through all the ways that we've had to tweak this for our clients. I'm think I'm like all of a sudden my head is all over the place and I'm four or five pages in trying to explain exception after ex exception. And I think to myself, I mean, at this point I've confused myself, which is not a good thing as the author because I, my readers likely are going to be confused over this as well. I mean, think about it. You might pay your coaches a flat rate per class for a group training. You might pay them a percentage for personal training then maybe you give them a percentage of sales if they push nutrition, like a supplement stuff. And others might be like, well, I pay them a flat rate for personal training. And then I pay, pay them a per head count for group training. Like every gym has their own different unique way. I feel like of compensating their coaches. So I'm like, okay, well, how do I marry these two? And I said, I got it. Let's create a separate bucket for team member expense. That way, regardless, whether they pay them 1099, whether they pay them W-2, whether it's a flat amount, commission, any sort of combination of that, all of those expenses go in the team member expense bucket. So now for micro gyms, Profit First for micro gyms has the essential seven accounts. So we have the income account, owner's pay, profit, tax, equipment, um, did I say operating expense, uh, team member expense, yeah, I think I got them. Okay. Oh, anyway, so those are the seven. Um, so that's one of the big differences and it helped bring a lot of clarity to gym owners because now whether they're paying their people W2 and the guy down the road who has a financially fit gym is paying them 1099. I know that both of those, like a financially fit gym 
ha is paying anywhere from 25 to 44 percent of the revenue to their coaches if it's more than 44 percent i know that they need to look at getting that number down Re so they can still have their own flexibility with how they compensate it but they can now compare themselves to the financially fit gyms and see what they're doing and try to set goals to get there gotcha okay so, so that was um one change the other big change with profit first for micro gyms comes with the actual table itself so i don't know if anyone listening is thinking well well how do i know what to put into those other buckets okay um what we did is we created a table based on the size of your gym uh we you would look at the table and see oh this is the percentage i put into these different buckets well with the original system mike looked at all businesses across many industries not to include or not to exclude like massive difference in sizes so his table goes up to 10 million dollars and there's like five columns um we encourage running profit first per location so you might be a 10 million dollar gym but you have 15 locations uh each location is what we're looking at when it comes to running the profit first system you run it per location and so I don't know of any gym out there that um, is 10 million per location. And I've heard of rumors of a handful of people who say their location is a million plus. If you are one of those gyms, I'd love to look at your numbers just so I can verify and have sanity because no one's willing to share those with me. Um, but that being said, so I just redid the study. I'm like, let me just do the study for gyms. So now our table consists of data only looking at financially fit gyms per location. And so the percentages that we are recommending in the Profit First for Micro Gyms book is specifically targeted to the gym owner instead of the gym owner looking at the original system and saying, I don't think those percentages are gonna work for me. Yeah, they're, they're not gonna work for you. I can tell you, because we tried to do that, which is why we had to write the book. That's, uh, I love that. So what I want to know, I mean, because most gym owners, myself included, when you start um, talking numbers and accounting, my eyes just kind of glaze over. So um, how do I use this so that I can sleep better at night knowing that, uh, knowing how much money my business is making that I have enough to pay my employees, that I'm putting enough away for taxes, and that I still have enough to live my life and take care of my loved ones. Yeah, so what I love about the Profit First system is it takes out this need to budget. You know, oh, you should have a budget and whatever. It's like, well, Profit First is my budget system. So the bread and butter of the system, it says either once a week at most or at least twice a month, you're going to sit down and you're going to look at the income that's deposited in your income account. Based on the percentages that you can just pull from a table, so you don't have to think about it, you're just comparing, here's my revenue, this looks like the percentages I need to be using. You're going to allocate, you're going to sit down and literally transfer the money from your income account to these separate buckets. By doing that, you're already protecting yourself so that you know you're paying yourself the right amount of money. You know you're setting aside enough cash to cover that tax burden so that when your accountant says you owe 30 grand in tax, you're actually like, good, I got more than that set aside. You're setting aside money into your equipment account so that you know when your equipment does break, you've already got the cash available instead of, oh crap, what broke? Oh, how am I gonna come up with two grand to fix that right now? It's all taken care of. And then you're now just running your business day-to-day -day operations off of the remaining amount that's left in your operating expense account. So literally by sitting down and just following the system, it automatically takes care of those things without you having to worry about the numbers per se. You just have to actually show up and do the workout. So Profit First basically programs the financial workout for you. You just gotta show up and do it. Gotcha. Okay, so that helps kind of put your your fitness facility on financial autopilot, so to speak. Absolutely. So they can run smoothly. What happens when 
I try to implement the profit first for micro gym systems in my gym. And I find out that I don't have enough money to put in all the buckets. Where do I start? Yeah. Um, so uh, just so no one gets discouraged, there's a 90% chance that when you do run the profit first system, you're going to the first month and potential for me, it was the first year you're going to run to that scenario where like, I don't have enough money for these different things. So you can tweak the percentages for sure. We always recommend uh, starting like your profit distribution bucket, 1%, but let's just create the habit to go to start with. You're going to look at your taxes and you're going to be, hopefully maybe you get guidance from a professional. They can share with you the exact percentage, which is going to be less than what the table recommends. So really at the end of the day, you tweak the system to work, but you then become a warrior and super aggressive on getting your percentages to where financially fit gyms have them. So typically what happens is they're putting 1% into the profit account. We come up with a flat dollar amount to put into the equipment account or maybe 1%. So super small, not a huge burden. We're more interested in protecting the owner's pay first. And so we want to make sure that that percentage is enough to, that the owner is going to have a good living. Then we are super aggressive on the operating expense accounts and are generally um, in our second and third meeting with our clients. At that point, we're talking about analyzing your expenses. And we think every gym should set the goal of finding 10% of their expenses to cut immediately. You can always add them back if you made the wrong decision, but likely you're, you're going to find 10% that just isn't worthwhile. Um, and, and so it, it is a process for sure. And like I said, the first year I ran it, I always found myself when I'm doing allocations, I'm like, ah, where, how is there not enough money to put in all these different buckets? Um, it's normal. It's very normal, but it's a process. It's not, it's not a light switch. It's a dial. Okay. Like a dimmer. Yep. Like a dimmer dial. Gotcha. Okay. So um, where are some of the most common areas that you've run into that where owners find are fat expenses? Yeah. So trimming the fat, so to speak. Um, it, for sure, it always seems like every gym has a couple music subscription things they're paying for. You only need one. Um, but then honestly, at that point, it becomes so unique to each gym owner, but it is typically, if I put it in a category, it's those 10 to $20 a month expenses that um, just get add up, they add up. Because the thought process is, wow, it's only $10 a month. I don't wanna take that time. It's probably gonna take me an hour to get on the phone to cancel this stupid thing to then have to talk to the guy who's trying to, going to try to sell me on keeping it in the first place. I don't want to go through that. So you put it off, but you get four or five of those expenses that adds up over the course of a year. Um, that's generally the, the typical expense level that we see. Um, with that in mind though, like we, we tell clients there's, there's two types of expenses and it's not, the fixed expense and the variable expense that you're probably used to hearing from an accountant or your accountant, because knowing if my expense varies with my income level or not, doesn't help me make better business decisions. What helps me is to know is this expense productive or not productive. So because every gym owner is in a unique scenario, we recommend they just go through that process. We have an entire chapter in the book on how to analyze expenses. But it all comes down to asking yourself, is this expense productive? Does it improve my member's experience, which means they're likely to stay longer? Does it um, give me the opportunity to generate more revenue? You know, if it's not one of those things, then it's not a productive expense and you shouldn't have it. We, we like to have ego expenses sometimes and we just, you know, like, um, for like CrossFit gyms, the Atlas stones and the big tires and the peg boards, like how often are you programming those into the workout? And when you do program them in, cause I, I've done the Atlas stones before. Oh good. My forearms are now hamburger because 
So, you know, it's like next time the Island Stones are programmed in a workout, I'm not showing up. I hate those damn things as a member, but you wanted it because you saw it on TV and it's super sexy looking. We have tons of those expenses. If we can be disciplined and ask ourselves, is this really productive for the gym, not for my ego, we can help eliminate some of those things. Then you might go, we recommend going back and looking at your expenses and asking those questions and immediately cutting out uh, the things that aren't productive, especially right now in this environment with the COVID-19 stuff. What was productive last month is likely not productive this month. Yeah, for sure. And what, and I know payroll's always the biggest expense. Is it fair to look at ways to cut your payroll? I, I think it's very fair. At, like you love your team and you want to support them, but at the end of the day, you're a business. And, you know, if your team member expense is more than 44% of your overall revenue, I know that you are in trouble. So you want to at least get to 44% and know that financially fit gyms are actually closer to 25%. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not a compensation commission structure expert. Uh, if there is one of those people, that's who I would talk to because a good compensation structure helps the gym win because if it doesn't help the gym win, it has to be off the table for you as an owner. It helps the gym win and it helps the coach win because it gives them incentive to make more money while still allowing the gym to win. So you have to, you have to have both in the equation uh, in order for it to make sense. And yeah, you could have a bad compensation model. Like I know for us in our gym, when we look at this expense, you know, we've cut uh, classes. Like what well, we've traditionally offered the noon class. How many people are showing up to that too? Well, I kind of need four bodies in that class to break even. So I need at least four. All right, well, Monday, Wednesday, Friday has better attendance. All right, so we started, we cut the Tuesday, Thursday class. And then Monday, Wednesday, Friday, it's like, yeah, we still only have three. Like, great, I love those members, but technically if they leave us because that's the only class they can come to, I'm still financially ahead by cutting those classes because of my coach costs. And you gotta make those decisions. Um, and that helps bring our percentages down. So things like that. Like, yeah, it's, it's definitely worthwhile looking into. Like you said, it's one of the biggest, Brent and team members are the two biggest expenses. Yeah, and I think you can only make those decisions based on the numbers. So if you're not looking at the numbers and diving into the numbers, as one of my other guests said, the numbers that, the story that your numbers are trying to tell you about your business, then you can start making those business decisions to cut those classes. So like you said, even if you lose those members, you're actually more profitable, you know, which yeah. is counterintuitive to most trainers because they want to serve everybody. Um, so that well, makes sense. And with that in mind too, um, this is why I love the profit first system because you can see, oh, I need to be at 44%. I'm at 55%. Therefore, it's already pushing me as an owner to try to solve that problem it's now identified a problem that I need to solve. And that's what's gonna trigger you to look into these things. Cause maybe it's, maybe it's your equipment cost, maybe it's something else um, that you're gonna realize, but the profit first system can help you identify areas. Like I, we, had, we had a coach who was very poisonous, very entitled, um, and we weren't quite sure, we were working with him, he was on probation to try to like improve that type of stuff. But, we didn't realize until I looked at the numbers um, because our team member expense was so high that literally this, like if he was teaching the six o'clock class, the 6 p.m. class, not on the same consistent day, the attendance for the classes that he taught was always lower than if the same class in the same, same time slot on the same day was coached by a different coach and it had higher attendance. So we could see that members were specifically avoiding this coach. We never would have seen that if the numbers uh, in the system didn't tell us to look at it. Nice, nice. What gets uh, measured gets managed. And I think, and I like it too, because we talk a lot about on this show about running your business instead of having your business run you. And so when you look at it from this height, I call it the, you know, 10,000 foot view when you're above and looking down on your business, then you can make 
decisions that really move the business forward, you know, versus being stuck in the day to day kind of crisis mode, putting out a fire here, putting out a fire here, or let me like your, your trainer, let me take him to lunch and try to talk to him. But then I'm not looking at the numbers, you know, let me try to, you know, convert this guy, even though right now he's a cancer on the team, you know, all this stuff. And you expend all of that energy and time and it's exhausting oh where, uh, where you can just kind of take a, a better view and say, okay, when this guy teaches, attendance is down. So people are avoiding. So it's not just me. The members pick it up too. They don't like this guy. He needs to go, yeah. so to speak. And then that just saves you so much time and headache and revenue, you know? So yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. So the other thing that I wanted to talk to you about was for me, when I hired a part-time CFO, the hardest part for me was showing them my books. I mean, and it was, it was like, I felt like I was back in high school and I was going to ask him to go to prom. You know, it's like that kind of like, I regressed to like this awkward teenager, you know, of like, okay, here, here are my books. You know, like I, it was like, I thought he was just going to gut me with it. But he's like, no, let's, let's look at them. They're numbers. They're not bad or good. They're just numbers. Let's look at them and see what we have to, uh, what changes we have to make to get them moving in the right direction. But it's a hard, hard, very humble thing. So how do you get fitness business owners over that hurdle? Yeah, I, the first thing is that we can't. The, the fitness owner, the professional has to get themselves over that hurdle. But the, the technique that we like to think about is we take them back to their own experiences and say, talk to me about a member that has come in through your doors who was either like massively obese or super sick from other chronic diseases because of lack of fitness on tons of, you know, like the biggest loser contestants. Every, every gym owner we know, they immediately can go to at least a few examples, for sure at least one. And then we help, we want them to think about that member, that person, because they took them through a journey. And now that person is healthier, they're going to live longer, all of that good stuff that happens through the services that you offer. And then we say, okay, that, think about that amazing outcome. Now let's think about what was that member experiencing the first time they stepped foot through the door? Because as far as they're concerned, Everyone who's at that gym except them is a supermodel, right? These guys are, they lift cars, you know, they're the types that, oh, you mean air squats, you mean push the earth down with my legs? Like that's the type of people these things, they think they're going to surround themselves with. And they have, they breathe heavy when they walk to the bathroom. Imagine that vulnerability that it took them to, and the courage it took them to, walk in that door and ask for help. That's what we're asking of you from a financially fit standpoint. Have that same vulnerability, knowing what the future looks like if you can just get over that one little moment of vulnerability. Because I'm, I'm sure, Jim, as soon as Ivan sat down with you, your anxiety went away as he eased your conscious and was like, within probably a split second, it's gone. Like you express the vulnerability and now he's like, Jim, it's okay. Like, Oh, okay. It's the same. It, it's going to be the same thing. You got it. Like face it with courage. And, uh, and then you'll realize it's not as bad as you think. And it's every one of us starts somewhere you're starting where with where you're at right now, but think about where it could go. And that's, that's what hopefully gets them over the hurdle. Yeah. Um, there's so much in that in that in an industry where we are professional coaches, we need to get coaching as well, you know, financially, business wise, wherever else we're at in our lives or our business, we need to get that coaching um, so that we can take our businesses to another level. And I had another guest on actually coming up, Mike RC, and he was talking about, he says when he's hiring people, he wants to hire people who can, teach him things, you know? So um, that's who I want to hire as my financial coach. 
somebody who can teach me how to grow my business with numbers, you know, and that's really, really, cause that's what I want to do. I want to be able to grow my numbers, take care of my team, take care of my clients and then take care of myself and my family, you know, go on vacation, you know, or do whatever, you know, um, to have the freedom, that financial freedom to make those, uh, those choices. That's what everybody wants. It's not that we want to be rich, but you know, you do want some financial freedom and flexibility to make some choices. Um, I mean, what has been your experience working with clients, like from that first awkward moment of vulnerability to actually getting them to be a financially stable gym? Um, well, I mean, it's, it's really a great, <laughs> it's the same joy that you guys get out of taking someone who's unfit and making them fit, knowing you're going to help them live longer. That's the same joy we feel when we get someone who comes in and, you know, financially they're a freaking disaster. Um, but we help them implement systems because it's not complicated. It's simple. It just takes, takes the work. It takes the dedication. Um, you know, I, I don't know what else to say about it like that. It, our focus, we want gym owners to realize they need to pay themselves first. Like we call it profit first for micro gyms, but the truth is it's cash for the benefit of the owner first. We need the owner to put food on their table first. And as you're talking about, like, it's not about being rich. We all have our own definition of rich, right? It doesn't have to be a dollar amount in the bank account. It could be financially resilient. The ability to withstand unexpected scenarios like this COVID-19, the ability to take time off out of the gym just because you want to. Like there's other aspects of wealth that are not necessarily tied to money. And you can get that with the profit first system, but the, the work's gotta be put in. It's, there's no magic bullet. Um, and I, I hate it when I see financial professionals tout a magic bullet that's gonna solve gym owners problems. You know, it's six week challenge. We're gonna do the six week challenge, but we're gonna end up bait and hooking all these people. And then you're gonna have pissed off members <laughs> and your current members that are really good. You know, it's like, there's no magic bullet guys. You gotta yeah. do the work. It's the same yeah. with the financially fit side. Yeah, like Tom. Uh, Plumber always says hard work is not sexy, but um, you need to do the hard work to get to the sexy parts. Um, you were talking about, um, shoot, I, I totally lost my train of thought, but I wanted to, to go back to, um, there's a almost a stigma in the industry, the fitness industry. And I don't know if it's unique to the fitness industry, but it's definitely, it's a, it's a prevalent belief in that some owners and trainers are ashamed to admit to themselves and others that they make money off of this because we're in the business of changing, changing lives. We want uh, our clients to know that we care about them, our, our team to know that we care about them. And so we have this kind of altruistic motivation to like be the type of person that they want us to be. And that person isn't in it for the money. But as Frank Nash said, so like when somebody says, oh, you're just in it for the money, he says, so, you know, I've busted my ass. I have tons of experience. I uh, did all the hard work, the non-sexy hard work to get this business up and growing. What's, what's Matt, what's the matter with me making money? What do you say to that? Yeah. Um, if, so a little insight into life as an author, because I was never one. Um, when you want to write a good book, the first thing you start with is uh, your core message. Like you have to define your core message and then that stays with you with every word that you write. And my core message in, in Profit First for Micro Gyms is as a gym owner, you deserve to be profitable because if there is a mindset that we need gym owners to have, it's that. You deserve to be profitable. I, I think it's not necessarily unique just to the fitness professionals. I think it's unique to people who offer a service that change lives. If we really think about what you're doing inside the walls of your gym or with your 
clients and you think about how you decrease their fat percentages, they typically can get off their medication. Think about the medical system and the way hospitals are set up and the way health insurance is set up and all the cash that goes into those in our economy, you alleviate that burden by helping someone become more fit. I truly believe the way to save humanity is through the gym owner services. And because of that, it can be difficult for gym owners to say to themselves, yeah, I deserve to make some money off of this. I'm saving their lives. Like they're a lot of times, like you're saying they're, I'm saving their life. I, I took, okay. okay. I, you don't need to pay me. I'm, I'm not in it for the money. You don't have to be in it for the money, but you have to understand you deserve to be profitable because the truth is if you're not making money, you can't be in it for the long haul. Mm. Like if your gym isn't profitable, it's being funded somehow, whether that's through another full-time job that you have or your spouse has, or you're borrowing money, whether it's traditional loans or your credit card debt just continues to rack up, your loss is getting funded. And eventually, people are going to stop extending you credit or you're just going to burn out and be like, this ain't worth it. I'm going to just go back to my full-time job because theoretically, you'd be better off ahead when it comes to a wealth standpoint doing that you have to be profitable in order to stay in business and the world needs you to stay in business. Therefore, the world needs you to be profitable. Therefore you need to accept that you deserve to be profitable. Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more um, that there's nothing worse. Like we talked about at the very top of the show of working this superhuman amount of hours in your business and then have having nothing to show for it at the end of the day in your bank account will lead to burnout. Uh, if nothing else, just kind of anger and depression too. You know, just like, God, can I catch a break? Well, start making yourself breaks, which brings me to the other point, like you were saying, and when you were making the, the analogy of, you know, when an overweight person comes in and we coach them and help them make changes and improve their lives, it's very satisfying, but it's simple. Like you said, it's simple. You got to eat better. You got to move more. That's it. But it's super simple, but the large majority of the people don't do it. And so, because they're not willing to establish those new habits. And I think a lot of gym owners are in the same boat. It's simple. Like put the money in these buckets and your gym will start working for you. But it's about establishing those habits and some owners have a hard time, harder time doing that than others. Like Thomas Plummer says all the time, I can fix your business, but I can't fix you. So like, what are some of the hardest habits that you see some owners need to break when they come to you? Doing work inside their gym for free. Oh, this coach can't pick up this class. I'll, I'll pick it up, but then they don't pay themselves the same rate they're going to pay the coach for that class. Like it's, it's this idea they're constantly falling on the sword with no financial exchange for the value that they created. It's the worst, it's the worst you, they've got to stop that. And like giving like friends and family benefits or side deals. Oh gosh, the handshake deals. Let's be done with it. I can tell you both sides of the party are pissed off about it. I people it's I've uh, at least, I've gotten a lot better at this, but earlier in my career, I felt like everyone was asking me like, Hey, I'll give this for you to you. If you do my taxes or like, let's swap services. Let's have a deal. I'm like, you know, no, I'll pay you for your service, what you charge because I value it. And I want you to pay for my service because I want, I hope that you value it. And if you don't, then it's easier for you to fire me instead of us continuing to go on back and forth where you're thinking you're doing more on your side. I'm thinking I'm doing more on my side. We, we're both going to end up hating each other. It's not fair. And it's also, think about it, totally unfair to all the other members you have that are great, that are paying full price, who aren't getting that deal. Why are they any different? Like, it's the same value you're creating for them, so charge for it. Yeah. Yeah, I heard somebody saying, I can't remember um, who it was, is that the day I decided to not do anything for free is this the day I started really making money. 
you know, and I think that's a great point. All right. Um, John, this has been great as usual. I, oh, uh, as usual. And I really appreciate it. Now it, it, it brings us to my favorite part of the show, which is going to be different. So what happened with John and I really, it was me. It was me. It wasn't John at all. Is that we, we recorded this episode yesterday. At least I thought we were recording it. And then at the end, when I'm signing off, I noticed that I didn't hit the record button. So we had this whole conversation and none of it was recorded. So he was kind enough to come back today and record this, which I'm grateful for. Um, and so these answers are not going to be a surprise to him, but if you could in, uh, indulge me in the listeners. So what has been your most successful failure? If you can remember what that was. Yeah. And, and um, luckily, just so you know, I have a terrible memory as well. So am I, I may not remember the answer I gave yesterday. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, but no, in this and case. COVID-19 is, is excluded from these questions. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think about I, one of the first team members I hired when I was just me and a, another uh, assistant, the first accountant I hired, uh, it was really good. We grew together. I helped him grow in, you know, his ability to be a good tax professional, a good accountant. Um, and he was with me from the, him being my third employee. And then we, we got to the point where, where there's 20 of us now. And as the business has evolved, I've evolved. Um, but as a leader, I failed to help him evolve. And it got to the point where he became a poison to our organization. There was a lot of entitlement. I know he wasn't happy, but, you know, honestly, he was making phenomenal money. And I think he just didn't want to think of, like, have to leave and do stuff on his own. And so I had to make the hard, I had to make the hard decision of being the one who initiated the process to get him out. And it was a very ugly separation. Um, like, months and months of our attorneys going back and forth on reaching an agreement on what was fair. And uh, at the end of the day, the, the agreement wasn't fair that we separated with, but that's because I just needed to get poison out of my organization. But so I, I, I failed to lead. Um, I think as owners, it's important that we ex describe our vision to our team, that they know what you're thinking because you want them on board. You're, if, I mean, if you started off as just a trainer and you had 20 clients and then you opened a brick and mortar and now you have 150 members, you have 200 members, you have like things evolve. You can't operate the same way you did at a smaller level than you do at a bigger level. And keeping your team on board with you requires you to explain that vision to them and, and answer any apprehension they may have as you start to explain things. And I, and I failed with that with this guy. And he was a dear friend, and obviously we're effectively bitter enemies at this point. Um, and, and, you know, that failure is on me. Yeah, I, I agree. And I went to a great seminar. It was an, actually, it was an okay seminar, but it had a great title. And it was, were they dead when, they, when I hired them, or did I kill them? Mm. You know, um, and so that looks at two things. One, the hiring process, and two, like, Am I giving them what they need to be successful? Am I empowering them? Am I leading them? Am I communicating with them so that they can grow with me and grow with the company? Um, and so I think that's a, a great answer and so true. I think that's one of the things that I had to learn when I went from being a trainer to being a business owner. I realized that I had to be a better, I had to become a better leader. You know, because the, this is my company, you're going to do it the way I say, and I'm going to be here. I'm not going anywhere, so you better do it this way. I found that most people don't want to work for that guy. Yeah, it's crazy, right? <laughs> <laughs> They're like, I'm out of here, see ya. And so I had to, like, change. I had to become a better, more effective leader and think about them and, know, and let them know that I had their best interests in mind and, you know, constantly check with them to make sure they had everything that they needed to feel successful in the job as well. Um, so that's a great answer. My next question is, since you've been working in the fitness industry, 
what has been the biggest surprise that you've had to deal with that you didn't see coming? So um, ha before I got in the fitness industry, we had worked with hundreds of gyms. And I could look at a financial for a gym owner and, and tell them what, like, what's going wrong. Like they're, I can identify some things that are wrong, whether they don't have the right revenue streams or certain expenses are too high, they need to cut them back. Um, and then I got into gym ownership and there is this whole element of uh, dealing with humans that, you know, <laughs> I was not expecting. Um, you know, when we give advice, when we gave advice to clients prior to me being an owner, sometimes I'd be confused and frustrated when it took them a really long time to implement something. It's like, look, all you have is group training. Like, you should be offering some other revenue streams if, if you want to have a you know, more stable financial picture. It'd take a month to get something going. I'm like, what the hell is going on? How does it not take a week? You just, you know, do it like this. Boom, boom. And uh, then we tried to implement changes in our gym. Uh, I, I bought into a failing gym on purpose, trying to see if, you know, more kind of a challenge type of thing. And uh, yeah, change takes a long time because it requires your team to help you make the change. Um, also, when it comes to the human element, you know, never once as a CPA have I had a client come to me and say, you know, I looked at what you're doing with your business and I think you should, um, I think you should do it this way instead. Yet as a gym owner, almost weekly, somebody wants to suggest to us a better way to run the gym. Um, even though maybe their, their job is being a, like a hostess cupcake delivery truck guy. Uh, and they have no business and the, they have no experience in the fitness business, but they're experts because they can do fitness movements. <laughs> Um, and so I think that can actually get in the head of a gym owner if, if they're not careful. You start actually uh, wondering if, if it's the majority of people, but the reality is you have to accept it's the loud minority that's talking to you. Um, but it, it, can, it can kind of affect your headspace a little bit if you start listening to people because you start second guessing even though you know you're on the right track. Yeah. And I think I find that true to be find that to be true in the fitness industry, especially with trainers. And I know we talked about this before, but I know I was guilty of that when I was at another, I was a trainer at a facility for 20 plus years. And I was thinking, oh, you know, uh, why don't we do this? That would be awesome. Clients would love it. You know, all of this. Uh, if I was running this place, man, it would just be so fucking dope. You know, people would love it. We'd be crushing it from a business standpoint. And then I left and I opened my own studio. And like, it was, it was for me, it was like, after you uh, move out on your own after college, and then all of a sudden you realize, you know, my parents are actually pretty smart people. <laughs> all it's a little them, bit more for me than I gave them credit for. Exactly. <laughs> all, all the time I was bad mouthing them. I take that back. I'm sorry, because this shit is hard, you know, and it's the same with running a business. There's so much that goes on that you have to consider behind the scenes that um, it's a whole different animal. So I find that you get a lot of your staff if you're not careful, if you're not managing them correctly, if you're not leading them correctly, uh, bringing them in on the process so they buy in, all of that stuff, then you wind up with that mutiny, tamp, uh, mutiny um, uh, mindset of, well, I can do this better. And Jim sucks at running a business. I know I could, if I was running this business, it would be a lot better, blah, 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 blah. So, but there's so much more that goes into it, but I find that to be true. So, I can totally see that, uh, see that uh, human element and managing people is so much harder than I thought it would be. I mean, it's like, I thought, okay, here's our, here's our process. We're going to go over this, go. And I'm thinking, okay, we're done. It's like, no, every single hour, every single day, every single week, every single month, I have to hold them accountable to that process. Otherwise it erodes and then it doesn't work, you know? And so managing people just takes a tremendous amount of time and patience. Uh, and that's what makes those little 
um, policy shifts so hard to do. I agree with you 100%. I, I often wonder um, why business colleges for business degrees don't include way more classes on psychology. Yeah. yeah. I feel like right now I need to be, I need to have a master's degree in psychology to be an effective business owner. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I mean, because everybody puts weight on those disc assessments and mostly just for the hiring process. And then once they're hired, they kind of throw them out the door. But yeah, you're absolutely right. You have to, uh, it's, I used to coach high school hockey and I used to call it the art and science. The science is easy. You know, it's like X's and O's run this play and we have a higher chance of scoring, you know, or not being scored on. But then you have to pick the right players for each role, you know, and if you got a greyhound, you got to let that sucker run, right? You can't keep them in a cage, but on the same thing, if you got somebody who doesn't like to run, don't put them in a position where they have to run, you know? So it's all those little nuances. That's the art of coaching both clients and your team and being an effective leader. You're absolutely right. So I, I agree with you. I think more MBA programs need to think about that. My last question is, um, and you had a great answer on this is where do you go for your personal and professional development? Yeah. So it totally depends on where I'm at. Um, first of all, I do believe we all need coaches. If you look at every successful person that you in your mind feel like is successful, they have a coach. They all do. We need them for sure because they help you see things you don't see. They can give you the confidence to do the things you don't need to do. But um, it really depends on where I'm at in my business. I've had great mentors uh, in the past based on, you know, I have two employees. What do I do? They helped me. Um, hey, I want to grow my business and I don't want to rely on just client referrals like tr traditional accounting firms do. I hired a mentor that taught me an amazing basic foundation of marketing. And I'm so grateful for the year I had with those guys as they educated me. But then after the year, I learned everything that I could from them. So I moved on. And it's not to say they were bad people or bad mentors. It's just their services for a specific level. And I wasn't there. And so I, I always try to find a mentor that is able to teach me and help me with the area that I need focus on. So like right now, um, my focus is how do I help build a team that is motivated and wants to do the work without being micromanaged. And I understand that that is a lot on me as a leader to understand psychology, to understand, is this person a greyhound or a pig or a, you know, chicken, whatever the animal is. Um, and so um, right now I'm using a group, it's called the Kelly Roach team. And that's one of the things that she does. She helps business owners create teams so that they can scale uh, and so that yeah that I think it just it really depends on where I'm at but that's who I hire and hopefully I can outgrow them I mean that's kind of always the goal right mm -hmm. absolutely and I think that's great advice Mike Arce who's coming up on the show said the same thing he kind of picks mentors and coaches and books based on where he wants to go, not necessarily where he is now, but where he wants to go. And when you do that, then the, the message they give you really resonates with you. And the words seem to jump off the page because you're like, yes, you know, they get it. They understand. That's where I want to be, you know? Um, so I think that's great advice. Uh, John, thanks a lot for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. This has been great. Um, where can people go to find more information about you, get in touch with you, learn more, all that good stuff? Um, so if they're interested in Profit First, go to ProfitFirstForMicroGyms.com. Um, that's a great way to get in, introduced to some of the concepts of the book. And then um, they can also always find me at InsightTax.com. That's to incite a riot, I-N-C-I-T-E-T-A-X.com. And uh, we have a ton of great blog posts, um, free, like we try our best to share good, valuable content in our uh, stuff we put out and you can find some great tax tips, for example, on our, on our blog. Awesome. All right. So if you guys want to know more about uh, John and Profit First or, you know, sleep better at night and go on vacation with your family and your loved ones, look them up. 
Uh, all the links will be in the show notes. Just go to trainergym.net and click on this episode of the show and the links will be right there. Uh, so you can sleep better at night, John. Thanks a lot, man. I really appreciate you doing this twice. I really do uh, for, for giving me uh, for my unbelievable mistake. But um, And I hope you guys have enjoyed listening to this and got something out of it. So, John, have a good rest of your day, man. I appreciate Thanks, it. Jim. All right. Take care and be safe. Okay. All right.